right, uh, welcome to another episode of the Critical Introverts Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Senor Filth. I'm with uh, my co-host, Benevolent Asshole. And uh, we have a graphic designer slash illustrator uh, and gun advocate, uh, Derek Weiss. <laughs> um, yeah, this is an interesting episode because uh, I actually... We did a recording on Friday, but I fucked up like an idiot <laughs> and the sound didn't work. So we're here again. And uh, yeah, so let's just get into it. Uh, Eric, you just want to... Yeah, yeah. It's always a pleasure to be back. <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> yeah. Oh, damn, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess, um, Derek, if you want to just introduce yourself. Sure. So uh, my name is Derek Wise. Uh, you'll find well, our little design agency is called Dead Eye Design. Uh, it's a mom and pop shop. Uh, my wife runs it. I run it. Uh, I've been in the industry for many a year. I uh, worked for large startups like Microsoft and not startup, well, it's not a startup, but I, I worked for startups <laughs> and large corporations and uh, toy companies. I used to be a creative director at Funko. Uh, kind of done just about anything in the industry that you possibly think of uh, from UX to UI to illustration to product management, all kinds of crazy mm -hmm. weird tech stuff. And now we're kind of, we moved away from Seattle and living out in the backwoods and, <laughs> and making a go of it doing freelance stuff. Okay. Um, I, I guess I haven't, didn't ask you last time, but like what made you sort of get into uh, your field? That is a fantastic question. So both my parents are actually artists. So they're, they were like old school hippies, uh, kind of had a, almost an art co commune kind of thing going on out in the Eastern Washington. Uh, so the, my parent, my dad has a master's in sculpture. My mother has a master's in painting. So mm -hmm. they did the most logical thing with those uh, really expensive degrees and they started a farm. So they, start, <laughs> uh, they, <laughs> they picked up a, my my uh, granddad's uh, apple ranch and made a go of making that back in the, the early 70s into the 80s and 90s. The apple farm took a shit. Uh, my dad always uh, banged my head, do not get in the art industry, you'll be broke mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Uh, so of course, when he's, you know, when I'm getting into school, that's when the farm started to take a shit and a small mm -hmm. farming was taxed into oblivion and you could only be a large corporation international corporation to actually make that kind of farm stuff the small family farm stuff go so we, we went the way of the dodo bird and i became a designer and uh you know got away from the farm stuff and my dad uh my dad still has a fruit stand and winery in eastern washington called red sky orchards mm -hmm. uh it's on the way to seattle if you're coming uh from the east side and it's going to the gorge if you're in washington state uh, mm -hmm. coming from the west side uh, like at what time period would you say like the uh, your, the farm the apple farm started going going to shit? Uh, we actually were late. We we hung on to that thing. I would have been third generation on that place uh, running that place. Uh, we, we probably it was two thousand two thousand one. Mm -hmm. uh, we started my college football career, mm -hmm. so it was uh, it was right around then we lost it. It was actually a funny story because you know. When you're apple farming, you're very reliant on the weather. And mm -hmm. so the hail and rain and the snow at long times of year can really, I mean, it can really screw you up. So we, uh, the, it was in selling the farm and coming to that conclusion. We started our first day to try to save the farm. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard, it was a hard go. You know, you know, it's completely out of your hands. You have, you have the weather to, to kind of fight against. You have all, you know, all these extraneous things when the, your own government makes it impossible for you to do business it hurts even worse we, we did the best we could and we lasted longer than most mm -hmm. and uh because of taxation and over regulation it pushed us out you know and that, that's why i'm a big advocate for small you know shop locals type stuff that's one of my more left-leaning <laughs> kind of <laughs> ideals like stay away from big you know, you got to shop local because that's where, you know, keeping your money in the local uh, economies is better than going international. So mm -hmm. yeah, I went on a tangent there. But like, <laughs> I, I can talk about farming for a whole entire podcast if you want. I'm but, out. Uh, it's an it interesting was like topic. So yeah. it was about 2000, 2001. Uh, we sold the farm. 
the day we got the check, it was like someone died in our family. It was like granddad died all over again. And as soon as we got the check, the whole entire farm was hailed out. Not one damn wow. piece of fruit got. It, it, when we were out there, in the, out in the uh, usually when hail shows up, the whole family's out there just bawling. It's like, oh my god, are we gonna freaking make it? And yeah. We've had hail storms come in, and we're take out one row, and off the whole 100, 200 acres was fine. And we're like, oh my god, we dodged a bullet in your farm next door. Got to- the the neighbors next door, they got decimated, and they went out of business. And, Wow. You know, they're working at Home Depot or some shit like that. <laughs> it's like a super depressing thing. And, and we made it. And the very last year, we got the check, cashed it. The whole entire farm was just obliterated. Wow. And it made selling the farm so much better. It was like, God's like, it's okay, guys. We'll do fine. <laughs> <laughs> do other things. <laughs> so, but we still we still have our homestead, the homestead out there. And we still have the, we only, I think they only have like, five acres of the, of the 200 that we had mm-hmm. but we still go out there and shoot guns and shoot squirrels and <laughs> do farm stuff but it's not it's not you know we don't have to worry about weather as much yeah and so what like after that what drove you to just go into like the art field uh, ability i mean i i going in going growing up i always was drawing like crazy and, mm-hmm. and i was as fast i was really into comic books and i could you know, you put a comic book in front of me, and I could draw everything in it. Mm. I was really into Star Wars. Uh, a friend of mine, I, I was friends with older kids in my in my class, and yeah. this one guy, I was it, I was I was in kind of in between like jocks and art nerds and band kids. <laughs> and stuff like that. So I, I'd hang out with my friends and just sit there and draw all day. I, that's what I preferred to do, mm-hmm. and I was just good at it. I had a talent at it, and I pursued it and studied it. My in the you know, I, I had art books just laying around. Uh, mm-hmm. My when I was bored, my mom would make me paint with oils, and I was okay. I was only allowed primary colors. I couldn't I couldn't just get like beige. I'd have to make it. So like I had a, by the time I got into like grade school, I had like a pretty serious art history background, and I could you know I could mm-hmm. talk about Duchamp and stuff and like you know. <laughs> grade school and i was i was bored in class all the time i was drawing and yeah i get like i had dyslexia and, and uh i used my art skills to pass high school like, <laughs> <laughs> edit and drawing posters and I, my first logo my first paid logo was probably i think it was my sophomore year in high school i got you know I, they I did a logo and they paid them like, the basketball floor and, like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Like my brother's wearing a basketball jersey of my with the logo I made. And it's it's you, like you kind of get a big foot, and that's really neat. Do you remember how the logo looked like? No, I I, ha- I still have it. Uh, hmm, I don't think I have it here, but I can I can find it. It's like it's it was East Valley High mm-hmm. School, mm-hmm. and I, I connected the E and the V, and it had, it, we we're East Valley Red Devils, mm-hmm. and the V had a tail coming off of it that was a spaded mm-hmm. tail, and mm-hmm. it was kind of. In between a fan ser- like a serif font, it had like little edges to it, and it looked very devilish. The e had kind of slight horns coming yeah, out yeah. the red devil, and had a tail coming off the Y or the, uh, the V. I mean, that's it was pretty- cool. It was a cool logo. That I still see it crop up locally, so oh, that's pretty. I, cool. I don't want too far away from there. Do you know if the uh, the the school do they still use a version of that logo, or they totally changed? Uh, it seems like they're getting rid of the red devil stuff. So. Oh. Weirdly enough, PC culture, even the devil is involved with like it's still there, <laughs> but uh they they just went very basic. They don't have the mascots. I was really into the uh seventies mascot they had. It was like a baby, mm-hmm. it had like a diaper on it. It was just so it was looked like a old seven like it looked like an old school hamburger joint, but a uh-huh. devil. I, I, mean, I just absolutely loved it. It was rad. <laughs> had, like he had a little pitchfork and he had like a very mischievous dude and it was pretty rad. I, yeah. I mean I'll I'll find stuff, maybe we'll I'll send it to you guys before uh, before you guys. Yeah. I noticed too. Like uh, I used to love uh, just jersey design, and uh, especially like the NBA jerseys. Like the Raptors old jersey was just awesome. Like the jer- like a Raptor with sneakers on it. And uh, I noticed oh, yeah. like recently they've changed that, and now like the lo- the jerseys are just boring. Like they're just the text and just yeah. the flat color, and <laughs> it's it really sucks. <laughs> With the exception of any team coming out of Portland, 
really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although the Portland jersey is always been like one of my favorites, just the diagonal colors, the red and the white with the black, I think. Oh, the Trailblazers? That yeah. logo is a fantastic tra The Trailblazer yeah. logo is one of the best logos out there. Yeah, it's pretty badass. That one and uh, I think there's an old school, the, Indi the old school Indiana jersey too, I think from the 70s, yeah. I think. Uh, similar, it's like a, the wavy yellow and blue lines through the center, I think. I, I, it's been a while, but yeah, that, that jersey's yeah. fucking awesome. Anything, any logo coming out of the golden era of design, mm -hmm. which is 60s and 70s, it, like that really basic, scalable design, and it can turn into like incredible looking jerseys. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, that, was, that was a hype. I mean, the 90s were cool with like, the colors and stuff, but man, the design is terrible. Yeah, it was really bad. And and, and we're I think we're kind of going into a dark ages of design right now, where mm -hmm. you know we keep going back to gradients and overly cluttered stuff. I think it's almost a uh, it's it's almost a touch of like how distracted we are with social media and content, mm -hmm. and it's like we're reflecting into our design a little bit, where things aren't just defined and, and rigid and uh, not necessarily rigid, but clean. Yeah. To the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess since you have a, a pretty wide background, like within the last maybe ten years or so, uh, how would you say like just the, the design field has sort of changed? Um, it's changed for the worst and the best in a lot of ways. Like, this is a little different movie, a little different topic. I think it's because of my work day today was pretty interesting, fascinating. I had a mm -hmm. uh, interview with a product manager that worked with like companies like Google and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned about some different stuff that like Google's doing structurally, which mm -hmm. I, I, I really like. Uh, the way you can, you can be uh, super creative and super analytical and have a role in the design industry, which I think is really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a new role called a, like a content designer, and they work they work specifically in uh, wireframes and building out content. So it's like a it's like a hybrid between a uh, like a like beginning uh, UX designer and wireframe maker kind of guy mm -hmm. or person, and then they uh, they also are like a content creator or a copywriter. That's, in my opinion, like having a really creative person doing copywriting, it, it goes contrary to the way the human brain works. Like, I'm not a very good copywriter. Yeah. I misspell shit all the time. <laughs> if you follow me on social media, I am misspelling stuff constantly. I'm not a dumb dude, but I do misspell things. You know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but the analytical folks, the, the really uh, thinking about web flow, like way websites flow and, and I'm almost like a developer, they're typically better on the grammar and the writing, things like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole grade in between. But this this content designer is was just a like I had I had to stop the interview and had had her explain that whole process to me. And that's really fucking cool that the design industry is this diverse and we're able to make these buckets and kind of slot things into really unique, specific uh talents it's, it's becoming more diverse in the speciality mm -hmm. like when i was a creative director at moz back in uh you know 2016 and 15 i was the that was doing the copywriting i was doing the design work i was doing the ux work the, the ux wasn't even a term really back then mm -hmm. but it was new and so i was coming up with a user interface and it was just like holy fuck there's a lot on your plate like the sister <laughs> doing everything yeah and that was about my career like I have, I can, I can manage UX designers now, but I know I'm not the best at it. You know? mm -hmm. So now, now that we have this huge diverse group of people that we can do stuff. That is a good, nice positive. The negative thing is the lack of craft. The, the, like back in like the Bauhaus days, going into the, to the uh, end of the 20th century. Like we're, we're looking at folks that are like, you know. Saul Bass and folks like that there that are very creative and they can come up with a design system, mm -hmm. but they, they that's what they did. There was that one channel. So yeah. hopefully we're getting back into that realm where this creative is coming into like a really specific craft section 
Mm -hmm. Because the way our, our content is delivered to us and the way people are raised online, everyone's scatterbrained. Yeah. Everyone thinks they have to do everything all at once. So it's the craft of suffering, the attention to detail of suffering, the, the, it's almost like a mono think when you're, when you're coming what mm -hmm. logo design, you have to be very strict in your, uh, your path of how you create stuff. And mm -hmm. you almost have to have like a, uh, it's almost like a religion of the way, like, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, you have to have a set path of way you design things and, and be strict in that. I think that comes with confidence in your career mm -hmm. and, uh, it's you know it's like a set of morales but, but that you affect the design industry right so that's why Saul Bass looks like Saul Bass that's why other like other designers of that uh, of that era are very distinct but mm -hmm. are in that same kind of realm of thinking mm -hmm. we're lacking that Every, everything's so distracted now it's all over the place it's chaotic uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we can get back to that craft side of things and some designers are doing it like a uh, uh, designer. Uh, there's a few designers that come to mind that are really good at a certain set of things, and they, that's just what they do. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, what's the name? Um, Alan Peters is that his name? Let me look him up real quick. Alan Peters. There's a few designers out there that are just excellent at what they do, and that, that there are good signs in his industry. But as a whole, it's a little chaotic, and everyone's trying to copy folks. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that, trying to force themselves into a, a particular look or feel. Mm -hmm. kind of feel uh, Peter's company, right? Alan Peters? Yeah. Alan Peters, yeah, that guy. Hmm. I'll check him out. I think that's pretty much. <laughs> yeah, Alan, Alan Peters. One of the, I think he's the best logo designer mm -hmm. that our generation has to offer. He's, he's kind of my era, but he's the best logo designer in my book. Mm. So you think a big problem is just that, like, that, uh, that ability for people to just be specialized in one thing is kind of dying um it's less attractive i don't know hmm. if it's dying there's people doing it yeah there's a there's a handful of folks that are actually thriving in it and mm -hmm. if i were to give advice to somebody is you know if i was going to give advice to a beginning designer it'd be try everything mm -hmm. get good as much as you can and figure out what you're good at mm -hmm. once you figure out what you're good at put the pedal to the metal if you're good at this certain thing and you're getting traction here, now that's what you're doing. Don't deviate from that and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can try new things and try new mediums, but once you do that, again, floor, pedal to the metal, go after that thing. Mm -hmm. You're reckless and don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like the same thing like in the 3, uh, 3D world too. Like That's like kind of like my background too is that mm -hmm. when I was studying that, I don't do that anymore, but like when I was studying that, there's there's animation there's modeling there's um uv unwrapping there's like a whole like there's lighting you can animate the camera you can there's like a bunch of stuff there's like different um there's like seven different interfaces for different aspects of like computer animation and initially like i tried doing everything i did like a little bit of animation a little bit of modeling a little bit of like uh camera work and in the end like you said like you do, you do need to like eventually like try everything but you need to like hone in onto like what it is that you're good at and just keep uh nurturing that that part mm -hmm. and uh i think that's the, the easiest way and the best way to excel in the field that you're um that you're trying to go for that that's why like i've been doing a lot better now that i've kind of focused like with uh, with, uh cartoony with uh drawing characters i've just kind of just focused uh mm -hmm. doing that i mean there's like a lot of other stuff that i i I, I haven't been doing like any of the other stuff because I've been so busy, but just focusing on just that one aspect, one one skill, it, it, is, it, it just makes it easier because it should be like second nature. Mm. You should just be able to just just do it. But uh, yeah, I, I, like you said, it, people, <laughs> including myself, uh, <laughs> it's really easy to get distracted like nowadays with all the stuff that's going on. And uh, it's funny too because i was going to say this uh, i think it makes sense to bring it up right now is that uh we're so distracted that even like, even like with instagram it's a lot easier to communicate with people through instagram than like anything else it seems like it's like so addictive like social media mm -hmm. uh, it's so addictive that you can text somebody you can email somebody you can do all this other stuff to try to get a hold of them 
Mm -hmm. but like you, <laughs> you send like uh, you'll you'll talk to them like on the Instagram uh, direct messenger, and they'll be like messaging you like at 11 or 12 at night i'm like oh shit like i couldn't do this like i couldn't text this person like this late yeah. at night like like messaging me back and forth i'm like oh crap i just like it's like i just came back from like working all day like i don't want to do this but like you, you're i i, I go through it because just because i know they're making themselves available and it's part of the addiction that they have some like yeah. you know, take advantage of uh their attention now to, to book them. Yeah. I highly recommend a Faraday bag. So it's like, it's, it's like a Faraday cage and it's like a little bag that uh, I might have it somewhere around here, but it's a, before I go to bed, I put my phone into my, uh, if everyone's in the house, my uh -huh. wife was gone. So I have my <laughs> phone on me, but I put it, my, my phone in my bag so I can get some sleep because I got yeah. notifications. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. And <laughs> so I put my, I don't want anyone calling me. You know, and I, I want to live in the 90s for at least yeah. while I'm sleeping. <laughs> and I put it up, it brings no signals going out, no mm -hmm. signals going in. Yeah. And I get a lot better sleep. Yeah. I just fly yeah, out, I, know, like, I just fly out, turn off my phone uh, when I go to bed. Like, yeah. Like, I, I never like have it on. Like, I usually, that, that one time, um, well, it's happened other times, but like that, that time, it's usually when I'm getting home late from like an event. Mm -hmm. I also have my phone with me to kind of help me with GPS. So mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh shit, like I'm getting all these messages from this person. Like, they didn't mm -hmm. answer my text, but they're like trying to get a hold of me now through uh, direct messenger on Instagram. So I'm like, okay, well, I should probably talk to them. But yeah, usually like what I do, like I, I put my phone like in the, like a different part of the house, like in a different room mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> but like I don't sleep. I don't have like the phone in the same room as me. Like I know like a lot of yeah. people that I know, including family members, like, they go <laughs> sleep with their phone. Like, no, I just yeah. put that away. I turn it off. I put it somewhere else. It just, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the only way I can sleep. <laughs> yeah, the phone thing's weird because even like when I go on vacations, uh, I'm, I've never been one to like take pictures and even with like my phone like people think it's weird i'm not taking pictures of my phone but i'm like i'm just you know absorbing what i'm looking at I mean, it's, yeah. yeah 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 so you can't take your pictures with you yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so as far as like the design world or the creative world changing in that way uh would you say anything has sort of changed on like a um like an ideological level well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the <laughs> as we all know, the the, the design industry is incredibly left leaning, mm -hmm. like wildly, wildly left leaning. In fact, when there's elections going on, it's if you follow a designer, it's, un, it's like insufferable. Like you can't yeah. get away from the massive amount of virtue signaling. It looks like you know England during the you know the, <laughs> when the lemons are flying over and the freaking things are going over looking for planes like it's like insane yeah it's yeah <laughs> uh it didn't used to be like that like uh, yeah i think it started i'm gonna say around you know the beginning of this uh like 2014 was a pretty cool time to be a designer people just got, getting along and mm -hmm. you could talk to folks and it wasn't a big deal 2016 happened and the freaking everyone shit the bed like amber mm -hmm. heard like it was yeah <laughs> bananas. uh like you can't talk to folks if you say the wrong thing they will block you like like i used to talk to hellcat studio quite a bit now mm -hmm. they block me uh i i used to talk to uh aaron drappen quite a bit and i've actually done to a lot of uh been to a lot of uh speaking events with the guy mm -hmm. like around 2014 2013 i was actually doing a lot of speaking events and talking at dribble events and you know i was becoming that's where i started getting a little bit more popular especially in the seattle scene i was doing a lot of events and I was I invited because I was a creative director and a, a, a big local startup at the time and SEO was a big issue back then. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was invited to these things and hung out and did after parties and stuff with Aaron Draplin. We talked and stuff and the guy had a, a layer of sadness to him that was weird and then the elections happened and that that was turned up to 11. Like mm -hmm. That guy, was it's, he seems really nice in, on social media and and when he's talking, like when he's bragging about his work on all his speeches, like you, <laughs> you, uh, you, you think he's a really great guy, but the, if you disagree with him, even the slightest minutia, he turns into a very vindictive dude, and kind of a sad guy. And, well, and if you get to know him, he's a little bit depressed. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, I think if you met a lot of famous artists, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, 
like musicians and things like that. It's a very similar mindset. Uh, you, I don't think you actually know who's like your friend or, you know, who's being genuine. So if someone disagrees with you, it's such a shock. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's a microcosm of what, what a lot of people are going through, especially, especially in this digital world. Like, mm -hmm. uh, if someone disagrees with you or, or says like, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of bullshit. I don't, I don't agree with anything. And I'm super polar opposite. Yeah. I, the instinct today. And that's the norm today where I, when I was talking to Aaron, it was a, it was a micro, like it was a unique thing. And nowadays it's the calm. Everyone's Aaron grapple. Like <laughs> yeah. everyone, I'm on, they get very hurt and they want to destroy you. If you, if you think differently with them and you even see it on the right, like, mm -hmm. There's some folks that are very, you know, steadfast in their belief, and if you, you, if you divert a little bit, like that's yeah. it. Like you, no longer talking, they defriend you, or they like not going to talk to you again, or you don't get that relationships over with because you just deviated to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And it didn't used to be like that when I first started, mm -hmm. and uh, it carries over in the professional career. People get very vindictive and want to get you fired, and. Uh, that's how they win the argument. It's no longer about an intellectual exercise. It's more about uh, a vendetta. It's a war that we're fighting. So it's mm -hmm. we're, we're. I think we're going through kind of a an American divorce. The you know, Gavin yeah. McGinnis was going to put it together like that's what you would say. It's an American, <laughs> American divorce, and we're going through it, and we're going to have uh, we're going to have different economies and different groups of artists and different bands and. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that's just the way it works. If you deviate even the slice minutia, you'll be on this side or that side. Well, that's it's like, I think we brought this up before. It's like, we can't even agree what a woman is anymore. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, like, what Matt, the Matt Walsh, uh, <laughs> uh, movie. I haven't seen it. I haven't but, like, seen the documentary yet. Yeah. It's like, but highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People highly can't recommend even it. define what, we, we can't even agree what a woman is. And, like, yeah. I mean, how, how can we even, like, agree on, on, on things or, like, even respect each other's opinions if we can't agree on what a woman is or what words mean like yeah yeah but a, a question like that used to like invite like just a fun conversation but now it's just like it's gonna end with you know two people just uh being pissed at each other and it's yeah, from the beginning like, yeah it's because it's become such a religion and I, I don't i'm never gonna play the two sides thing i i am i'm, I'm more on the right I'm yeah. gonna be. A, I'm gonna admit to that. I'm, that's that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally, I don't see the right doing that as much. I mean, there are components of that, and mm -hmm. I see the. Uh, I see when religion gets in the way of, of an intellectual argument. Mm -hmm. That's when you start seeing that stuff. So mm -hmm. I equate with the like super extreme religious folks to the same types of folks that are like. You, you talk to some snake handler to uh, some of your run the day liberal. Yeah, they don't have much not in common the way they, they mm -hmm. can uh, approach an intellectual argument and disagree. Like that's it becomes a heated emotional thing very quickly, and that's when I think you reach the gap between a intellectual argument to a religious argument. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you how do you see this sort of like affecting? Um just the creative world, like this sort of divisiveness. Well, I mean, I won't be working for the New York Times ever again. <laughs> uh, I won't take work that is coming from that side of the fence. I, I mean, I'm to the point, I'm so jaded and I'm comfortable in my career. I'd rather work for people that uh, think a certain way or at least are willing to be open minded, like mm -hmm. uh, I run a group called the Design Underground, and I call our, ourselves a bunch of uh, of not lefts, mm -hmm. not necessarily right, but not lefts. <laughs> uh, so you have to be able to have a good art. You have to be able to disagree with folks, have an intellectual argument, not necessarily being right leaning, but uh, there is a lot of that. I think that I think having that open mind thing does attract more right leaning folks, like. I'd say back in the 60s where that type of a free flowing uh exchange of ideas used to attract the left mm -hmm. uh, i just think the momentum on free thinking intellectual arguments there's more on the right nowadays for whatever reason mm -hmm. uh you know it's it's always the party that's pushing censorship that's going to be the you know the not <laughs> decided yeah like uh the democratic free exchange of ideas you know whoever's 
that's always that's always going to be my side of things, or that's going to be more interesting. It's just because it's more interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that makes me think about like um, like a lot of people that aren't going to work with the more generally left leaning kind of sides. Like, what's going to end up with the left is like the left is art is just going to be really just dull and boring and very corporate looking and i'm starting to kind of notice that uh, uh, big time i mean if you if you're a fan of star wars yeah yeah well we'll get to star wars you got to see it, you got to see it with the, with mandalorian right uh-huh. mandalorian was chef's kiss great mm-hmm. then uh the election started happening and then we got baba fett i didn't see that i heard it was i Did heard it yeah. <laughs> the the rainbow scooters were that was fascinating there was rainbow like, scooters oh man really oh my god <laughs> you almost you almost have to watch that series just like okay we have meritocracy uh-huh. and then we're firing folks all of a sudden in the mandalorian based off of political reasons oh, they god. do have boba fett uh like within a few years like within a year yeah and you get to see the difference and like Mandalorian. I mean, I'm literally like checking out and not watching it anymore. And the kids are like, "What the hell is that? <laughs> Why is the rain core tame? I don't get this. What the hell?" Yeah. And then we're watching. Like we're watching. Uh, I'm never gonna, not going to be involved with the uh, pop culture. I think I, I kind of mm-hmm. like bitching about it to a certain degree, so my kids can hear me talk about it. Yeah. That's part of my raising kids about uh, in pop culture. Like they talk about like, "Why is it so boring?" Let me explain that. Son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's is a very clear reason why we like the man, why we like Mando, and are big fans of it, and we don't like Boba Fett. It's, it's because of who's writing it. Uh, what a and bummer! Why that. are they the folks writing those stories, and why why is that character crammed in there when it doesn't make sense? Mm-hmm. Like we're watching a uh, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi right now. Mm-hmm. And there's a spoiler alert. There, in between Obi Wan, it's, it's the whole storyline is supposed to be Obi Wan Kenobi. This is why we're paying for the whole subscription. Obi Wan Kenobi is supposed to be fighting Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. They crack, they cram this POC in there that can't act. She's terrible, just to get a POC in there. And like you, you watch her, and they're like this, like group of uh, fallen, uh, fallen. Uh, with the, the, the Jedi's Jedi's Jedi? okay. uh, they're fallen space wizards and they <laughs> <laughs> they they're all and if you're Asian white or any other color you turn this white color pale you look like Darth Vader you look you look tortured you know, like, uh-huh. talk with a gravelly <laughs> voice and then there's the POC no makeup uh, you because she has no makeup and she's like kind of going against the grain of the whole uh, mm-hmm. the whatever they call their their ministry of truth that they have it, i mean it literally sounds like the ministry of truth the way uh-huh. you describe it. and you, you can tell because she doesn't have makeup on and and because she's going to go back to the light side she's going to be the main character that's going to be helping obi-wan kenobi uh. you can just tell just because they can't put like oh there we have we have a black lady Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to put any makeup on her. We're definitely not going to put white makeup on her. Like, <laughs> because she's going to be a good girl here in a minute. And like you can just tell. It, it, it ruins the show. Like It doesn't ruin it yet. It's still kind of entertaining. I'd say uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is is in the middle of Mandalorian and Boba Fett. Boba Fett is just trash. I don't fight really? me. I don't care. It's trash. <laughs> But anyway, that's my pop, that's my pop culture TED talk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Pope, uh, Boba Fett uh, is he like a failed uh, hero in that show? Or well, yeah, well, dude, he's not even in the goddamn show. Like, <laughs> he's, I think what have you have you seen him, dude? Like, um, have you seen him? I saw that he was in the like the ending season of The Mandalorian, and that was the last I saw. Um, and that was awesome. Yeah, when he was in that episode. I was like, dude, fucking Boba Fett. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he's in the series, and he's like, "This he doesn't do anything." He yeah, gets beat uh, up a few times, and like he's, I, I don't know. And he, there's whole episodes where he's not even there, and then Bo, and then Mandalorian shows up at the end. Like, what the fuck? why is this called <laughs> Bobo Fett? Like, okay. Do, do, do they explain no, how? Like, do they explain how he escapes the? Um, 
whatever the monster is in the uh, right. Return of the uh, Jedi. Uh, I forget the you know what I'm uh, talking about the sand yeah. monster thing. Do they explain sand that? from uh, <laughs> from uh, Tremors. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, okay, I know I'm I'm a nerd on this stuff. Yeah, it's okay. Have you, did you guys watch Parks and Rec? Some of it. I've never okay. seen it. So there is a scene within Parks and Rec where they're doing a town hall and someone's talking about they, they, they one of the guys i can't remember that he's like little little short fat comedian guy that killed his wife with, oh pat oswald uh, pat oswald yeah. talking like very good job yeah i know I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a dork too so don't worry about it you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway so he has a line in there where he talks about how boba fett escaped the escapes the uh trimmers uh, warm thing mm -hmm. and that is exactly what they did in the show which was yeah. kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> i mean scene for scene it was like right on the money that's how he explained like they took the right the writers took that straight from mm -hmm. that show in parks and rec mm -hmm. okay. which is kind of I, I i appreciate it because that's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. <laughs> um i guess since we can this is a question I've had in my head for like maybe a week or so. It was just this the the difference between like a blatant ripoff versus something that is heavily influenced but still maintains a, a level of originality. Like you could take the Mandalorian, which is heavily. I mean, it's Star Wars, but it has this level of uh, like interesting originality. But you, you mentioned the Boba Fett show, and I'm even killed more interest i had in it than i even thought i had but <laughs> well boba fett was very unique mm -hmm. in the fact that it made no sense and it was way outside the star wars universe so mm -hmm. <laughs> it took everything that was bad in, in the uh in the the later series of the star wars episodes back in, in the 2000s and they went with that which was a interesting choice but when it comes to like copying things and ripping things off is the the realization as you get further along in your career is like you are constantly ripping things off subconsciously and unconsciously mm -hmm. we're beings of uh, observation and replication like the reason we made it so far as a society is we didn't copy the chimpanzee that ate the yucky berry they made them sick right so, yeah <laughs> so that's ingrained to our dna and the reason we advanced as far as we have is because we're copying each other. Mm -hmm. So it is good, uh, but the difference is the honor aspect of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reason we don't like people that copy and rip things off is because it lacks honor and lacks discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you're a younger designer, it's okay to copy folks. It's okay to mimic someone's style as long as you're pushing that style and and, and taking it to the next level so you can pass that next style on to the culturally and, and, and improve society. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we don't like people that just rip one to one off. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm respond. I I've done it. I've, I've, well, especially when I was a kid, I mean, even mm -hmm. to this day, I'm like, you're drawing a logo. It's like, man, that looks like something like we've all been, there. <laughs> that looks yeah. like something. you can't find it. You can't find it. Where the hell? I gotta find this logo, and then you publish it, and someone's like, "Hey, that looks like my logo." I was like, "It yeah. does." Let me tag you in that. <laughs> so, so uh, you're never gonna get around it. We're so like if something like that happens, just approach the situation with honor, like honor. Don't go out there to copy somebody, mm -hmm. but uh, push society forward and improve on your surroundings. Just like if you're going out. In nature and make mm -hmm. it, when you leave a campsite leave it better than when you left it mm -hmm. i think that's how uh you should approach the design industry and, and and looking and being inspired by stuff like being being inspired is how you know major great leaps forward and society has advanced so i think you should be inspired you should look into stuff you should have people you uh you strive to be like if it's especially if the style that you like you know mm -hmm. that's what you're going after I think that's great. I think that's a good thing. It's mm -hmm. a healthy thing. I think folks that are like, I don't copy anybody. Like Aaron, I'm gonna say Andrew Ackland right now again. <laughs> that guy rips other designs off like crazy. He says he's 100% original, but he also has this other side of himself where he's, you know, storing and collecting all this unique antique stuff. I do the same. If you look around my office, I mm -hmm. obviously collect antiques too. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the difference between me and him is if someone if someone says that looks like something I've seen somewhere else, I'll admit it. It's like, yep, yeah, it's exactly right. <laughs> Either I, I I was trying to go that route, or I did it totally on accident. Like that mm-hmm. does happen. Like that's, I've done stuff that looks like one to one exactly. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I fucked that up. That was just <laughs> that was such a good design. I I copied somebody. So when I see somebody copying me, I approach that whole situation with the same mindset. I, I've had lots of designs ripped off, lots of logos, especially when I was in my flat uh, stage in my career, when I was doing logos and icons, it's one of my favorite things to do. Mm-hmm. And I've seen my work all over the place. I've seen it, well, just lately I did a logo for uh, Decent.com, it's like a heart design. I saw it in, in Target, same, <laughs> almost exactly the same design on a t-shirt, a kid's uh-huh. t-shirt. Like, well, that's, that, that's when I, I feel like, a lot of folks will go out there and, and, and get a lawyer and try to take it down and stuff. Like I'd rather have it up. Yeah. If I'm contributing to society in a positive way, I feel happy about it. So you think that has to be like a, just a, a genuine level of like respect and honesty um, to make it work? Yeah. Have respect for your craft. Have respect for the, the what you're doing. I think that's that's where uh, I think a lot of this generation lacks. Mm-hmm. is general respect for how societies are built yeah you know and, and uh the lack of tradition mm-hmm. i think that's where i think that's kind of where we're where we're going wrong in the design industry and the culture as a whole mm-hmm. that lack of tradition and you know contribute to it rather than tearing it down yeah um sorry uh I lost my train of thought. <laughs> was that good or bad? <laughs> uh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, when when I look at like again, like we're we'll stay on Star Wars. Like if you compare the new movies versus something like The Mandalorian, um, the one thing I like I noticed with the new movies is that they just didn't look like a Star Wars movie. Like they were so like beautiful looking like they're so overproduced and the special effects are fucking insane and stuff like that and it kind of took me out of it and then watching the mandalorian like there's little like there's legitimately like dirtiness to it which like which i really like like the stormtrooper uh you know their outfits that had like dust on them and shit like that and stuff like that like it just it really like brought me back to like oh that's that's what Star Wars looks like it's it's dirty like have you seen have you seen like an un uh, remastered version of like the original trilogy like a VHS copy yeah it's it looks so different from what you see yeah. like nowadays it's well again insane. it's craft right like they made every single little mm-hmm. fucking thing in that show and they had to recycle things so I think uh, when you appreciate it today give it more weight than you saw it back then because back then they were working on a more strict budget mm-hmm. and things were shitty because things were actually shitty <laughs> and they were trying to make it look nice yeah but that's that, that lent well to the uh the show because of the you know it just happened to work i think george lucas is one of the luckiest son of bitch in the world i think he's a terrible writer yeah uh, he's i think not good. he is i think the people that made the the, the stuff and the costumes and did some edits on the writing despite especially when george lucas was uh early in his career he didn't have a lot of control of those movies mm-hmm. you saw what happens when he had a lot of control of those movies yeah and you get 2000 era movies and he's fucking shit. yeah those are... ditto, uh, ditto uh 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 raider uh Razor Indiana Lush. Jones. yeah the, rid- the original rage the first two indiana jones were perfect mm-hmm. and then you have crystal skull that garbage pile let's is let's 100 control did that he was, was that 100 percent lucas yeah uh, it had a, lot, a lot of luke a lot more lucas than uh, you would want <laughs> yeah the thing that i remember most of that movie was the uh there was that embarrassing scene where his son like saves them with a bunch of monkeys uh remember that shit was it a monkey? I thought it was a gopher or a monkey. I walked uh, out right. Here. Yeah, there there was like a scene where there's like a car chase, and uh, yeah, I think he falls out of the car or something like that, and some monkeys, you know, come up to him and they they literally save the day, swinging on vines. It was really just embarrassing to watch. 
But that whole concept of having some uh, parameters in your creativity, Mm -hmm. I think translates as a designer too. Yeah. And and kind of ties back into what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Sell yourself some parameters, work within those parameters and get really good within those parameters. Don't try to deviate too much. Yeah. Right now I'm trying to get get good at illustration and working the loose. Mm-hmm. And if you if you if you watch my Instagram artwork, like when you go back far enough, I'm super refined and clean and doing logo design. I was really fascinated with mm-hmm. brand kicks and logos, but I missed my my days of when I was a kid doing really new stuff. My father was a fantastic cartoonist; he could just draw stuff. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get back in those shoes, so that's what I'm doing more today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm giving myself, okay, I'm over three colors. I'm going to draw with black and white and sketch stuff real quick. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if there's flaws and errors. And, you know, it's kind of my, it's kind of my rebellion against the tech industry is working really loose and like, doing <laughs> rap rod type stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the early Star Wars stuff was loose, but because it was a tight budget, it was two string budget, <laughs> the budget, and there, there was like three creative directors and they were getting stuff done. And then nowadays, it's this huge, vast array of stuff. Yeah. And, and there's so much technology and so much money. It's it's the easiest thing you can possibly do is get that really nice, polished look. Mm-hmm. And that goes against the early Star Wars, which is the original canon, right? Yeah. So when you see that original canon look, appreciate it more because it took that person in that meeting. Have you ever been in a meeting bad? You know, bad decisions. You can when you see a bad decision design wise, you can almost see the meeting. <laughs> There's some poor sap in the corner going, motherfucking, really? Yeah. That's yeah. what we're doing? And they're like, yeah, this is what money's at. And they're going to go that direction. I've been in a million of those shitty decision meetings. Uh, yeah. So when you see it, appreciate it more today than even you did back then, because they had the parameters were set for them were un- unintentional. Mm-hmm. The parameters you see today are intentional, which is more impressive, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like today, we were we were just watching that the latest. Uh, uh, oh my God, what's the series is right out right now? I just the said Stranger the Things. No, 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 no. <laughs> the Mandalorian. I, uh, so, no, no, no. The uh, the guy that trained George. Uh, oh my God. Uh, 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 Obi Wan. They were Obi Wan. Yeah. Obi, thank you. <laughs> and there's a scene where they're on. By a, a transport and there's stormtroopers come in and he's sitting down with mini leia as mm-hmm. a child and i've noticed that the stormtroopers had one of them had a different helmet on one was dirty and the body was clean mm-hmm. i was like mm, i love that that's yeah. really cool there was a m- moment where uh leia is in a tunnel escaping the bad guys and the lady that saved her from the bad guys leans down and talks to her just like Leia did when she was talking to the uh, trash can robot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intentionally messing some of these up because I forgot a couple of names. Uh, so th- those types of subtle little things just really savor that stuff because that, that that was that was an opinion someone had that mm-hmm. pushed it, and it was probably fought against because of time or lack of glossiness or it wasn't enough time to make it obvious mm-hmm. like those type of really subtle things just really savor that stuff and i i i double that down when it comes to content that's left-wing media that accidentally or intentionally is right-leaning mm-hmm. uh i i notice a lot of right-wing tro- right-leaning tropes within star wars like uh, if you talk to a leftist all the all the space wizards are leftists and all the the, the <laughs> empire are conservatives like yeah how the fuck could you even do the math on that yeah like the 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 uh the good side the light sides pushed out to society they're not allowed to talk they can't show their weapons the bad guys are trying to take their guns and their weapons away they're going <laughs> after their kids like fucking crazy like <laughs> like it's uh they they run they want to uh, all-encompassing government that controls your thoughts and your mm-hmm. econo- uh, economic value, and they want all the guns, and they want to take the guns away from you. I don't understand how you can look at that and not see how the the white side are, are Republicans and mm-hmm. the dark side are Democrats. It's easy to be a Democrat. It's easy to be the dark side. You just allow your emotions to control and anger and spitefulness, and I mean, that's the left, if you ever did the math on that. That's yeah. The left. 
<laughs> it's not the right. So I don't know. So I, I so even though that that's not what their intention is, I take those storylines and I mean I you can't get away from it, especially when you get in a nerd battle with <laughs> somebody in the office and you're like, well, you're the dark side. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and that's the, that's the new way you need to relate to them. Like uh, the left is notoriously applying their evilness to who their enemies are, mm -hmm. whether it was the Native Americans back in the day or us today. They, they are they always apply the most generalized dehumanizing elements to to their personality to you mm -hmm. to try to dehumanize you and make you the bad guy yeah so that's kinda, that's how I approach this stuff and it, it, it does work to a certain degree sometimes if you're willing to talk to, if someone's willing to talk to you you know they're not necessarily going to agree with you but they're going to look at you differently if you can apply these you know you can't talk. You can't talk scripture to them. So you're going to have to talk pop their <laughs> scriptures, pop culture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, let's. You mentioned like they're going after the kids. So let's let's go into just parenting in the uh, this crazy age of uh, what we call wokeness. Uh, you have uh, how many kids do you have? I have two kids. And age range? Uh... Uh, my daughter is going to be <laughs> in the sixth grade next year. Mm -hmm. And my son is in the third grade. Okay. <laughs> uh, so did, have you witnessed anything, um, you know, woke that was sort of trying to be pushed onto them? Yeah, I moved. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in North Island, Washington. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, they were, they were doing racial healing circles. Really, and my kid, my my kids were incredible. Like I'm a white dude. My wife is black, uh, uh, Hispanic, and uh, Islander. Mm -hmm. So we have a pretty mixed group of kids. Uh, they're kind of they're kind of mystery race. So wherever whatever they're <laughs> whatever the minority is, that's where they fit. Mm -hmm. So we're in an Asian community. They're Asian. If they were in a Hispanic community, they're Asian or they're uh, Hispanic or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, where do I put my kids in these racial healing circles? Are they white? Are they black? Are they yeah. an Islander? Like, what do you want? <laughs> to me, that was wildly racist. Uh, it was, uh, you know, what, we weren't getting around it. So we moved to a uh, red county in a blue state. Hmm. How did your and kids? How did your kids react when, like, when they first started seeing this kind of shit? Like, like the racial stuff. My kids stuff. were depressed in Seattle. They, I mean, we we're. It was in the height of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, when their recesses sound like a prison camp, they, they, they had little circles drawn out and you were mm -hmm. sit, you sat in your circle, whether Jeez. it's raining or shining, uh, you sat in your circle. And if you got up out of your circle, you got detention and they had people, uh, these blue haired liberal ladies with the uh, sticks, you weren't allowed <laughs> to get close to your kids or other kids. They couldn't, uh -huh. you know, play with each other. Uh, they had to be masked up. They, you know, they were, uh, pushing the vaccine on them. And, my kid has epilepsy. I'm not going to give my kid. Like we were told by our doctors that he probably shouldn't get the vaccine at the time because he was just coming out of epileptic seizures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the school didn't give a shit, so it was like, "Fuck you, we're moving." So we moved, and my kids just absolutely flourished. My my daughter was uh, on the EIP, which is uh, she wasn't getting good grades, and she had, they had to take uh, certain. Uh, uh, mitigation things in, in, in the Mercer Island School. She's an honor roll student now here. Like, wow. Immediately blossomed. Uh, ditto Jack. He had a little problem. With, uh, <laughs> he had issues being away from his friends. His best friend still in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But he's got like dozens of friends now. And he's out there. You know, our kids didn't want to get dirty in, in the city. <laughs> they like see mud like you. That's gross. And I'm coming from a farm. That's like, what the fuck's that all about? Yeah. Now I. I go outside after after school. He's out there just completely head to toe covered in mud, <laughs> got a hose going. I'm like, I'm cool, man, because you're allowed. You can allow your kids to go outside, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't in Seattle because you got all these creepers running around. I I have a like I had a, my I don't know if you heard in the beginning of this interview my German shepherds running around because I had to get a dark guard dog because I kept having bums show up in my yard at three o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. and I have a a very well trained attack dog. <laughs> uh, funny story. I was working three o'clock in the morning on a design project, and I look up, and my all my lights are off. And this is Mercer Island. Mm -hmm. I see a guy in a red coat climbing over my fence, 
I open up my window and I go get them. That's my really, you know, that's my call to go get something. Yeah. Because really, you know, right? <laughs> Most people do like German words or I just, I literally say get them. So if yeah. they're at my house, do not say, hey, go get that. <laughs> uh, so he went out and get, he, he started going after this guy and he had a, because when you go, when you're in the Northwest, you have to have a Patagonia down coat, whether you're a bum or not. Oh, here's mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and that he looked at the, my yard looked in the morning looked like we shot a turkey back there there's feathers just <laughs> so <laughs> was, he disappeared in the night and came back all happy and i gave him a steak and he went to bed no oh. but we don't have to do that here yeah. like yeah when, you, when your kids were doing like that racial training crap like how did they first react like did were they well, just confused oh you just pulled them out right away i pulled them out right away so they did it, it was like hey we were putting like we were uh putting a group we finally got to get on groups at a table and they put me with the white kids I'm like really you're the darkest kid in school <laughs> <laughs> the mercer island was all white kids all yeah, white. yeah, yeah. So they were like i mean they had to condense classes to get at least a table of like mm-hmm. skin tone yeah. Chloe kind of, she could, if you squint, you kind of maybe we think she's uh, uh, Italian, I guess. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, I thought I was Hawaiian. It's like, well, kind of <laughs> funny. I am a Hawaiian. Uh, uh, but uh, she was confused about that because we just did a cultural appreciation month and we did a bit. I did a big. Uh, I helped her with her, 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 uh, her uh, presentation. Mm-hmm. And we, that's how we found out my wife is black because her. A uh, relative was actually in Hawaii. They thought she was Hawaiian. Mm-hmm. And I looked at her grandmother when I first met my wife. And she looks like Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Like, you didn't look <laughs> Hawaiian. At all. I'm really tall. She was taller than me, like a, you know, place. Uh, what's that movie with the guys with big crop tops? It was a. Uh, uh, flat top or? <laughs> you mean like a, a flat, yeah, flat top? A big gray flat top. It was like, like back, straight up. Uh, it was like a house party. It wasn't house party. Um, yeah, house party. Yeah, uh, kid and play. Was it yeah. house party? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> she looked like that. I'm like, I don't know. She's. I've, I've seen a lot of Hawaiians in my day. She don't look Hawaiian. I think she's black. Yeah. It was a big joke growing up. <laughs> we, we did a DNA test trying to figure out some stuff with me, and uh, turns out my wife's black. Was like, what the fuck's going on? So we started doing like genealogy <laughs> stuff. The her, the relative in Hawaii was an African American. So apparently, <laughs> Spain. Uh, had a huge amount of uh, business people. They, they basically took over some lots of parts of the Congo, mm-hmm. and they had business owners like the 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 plantation, the, the banana plantations were started by African African American uh, uh, business people, not wow. even slaves. They're just really good business people and farmers, and they mm. gave them property out there, and and. They just they owned that property and it kind of dissolved into the population. But they were African. I mean, she looked. I found this lady on uh, <laughs> what's the app? Anyway, I found her. She was just African as the you know night as black yeah. as night. Big, <laughs> like she looked rad as hell and had this uh, huge plantation. And she sold it off. And she, I mean, Tara still has rights to the property down there. And like that's fucking fascinating i had no idea she wasn't even an indentured servant like my family came over in the u.s mm-hmm. like we were at least kind of slaves <laughs> <laughs> and her side was black and not slaves at all just rich as shit and I had a plantation in freaking hawaii <laughs> like super fascinating so we wrote this whole thing up so the school knew she was african-american to a certain degree but she still put them the white kids because my politics was known really in a school, I was I was becoming politically active in, in, in Mercer Island, and I was considered a Nazi. So, you know, was it was it like te- was it like teachers kind of like scoping out your social like, media kind of shit? Principal there, uh, we had during our IEP meetings. I was very. We had a situation where uh, I didn't like what they were doing with my kid with the education side of things, and not letting us know that she was having issues. So I went in there a few times, and they were like, "Oh, you're Dick. Why is the guy in line?" I'm like, oh. <laughs> i see where this is going so it's like is this political is are you doing this because of political reasons and no 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 because no. it's actually illegal to do that kind of stuff mm-hmm. in washington state you can't fire somebody because of your political beliefs even mm-hmm. though i've been fired at least twice <laughs> for my political <laughs> beliefs but they they come up with very they're very good at coming up with creative ways to not do that so yeah 
did something break right now or uh my dog came in and knocked down my flagpole okay then <laughs> it's leaning up against my dresser <laughs> So that's my dog. <laughs> What's the dog's name again? Trigger. Trigger. <laughs> like, trigger. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, I, he, he's like the name of uh, the trigger is from uh, that old Western. He's the horse. Western. Um, uh, not Zorro. It's the guy with the white hat. I uh, can't. Okay. <laughs> I can't think of it. Uh, and, um, now we only have a few more minutes left. Um, so I guess let's just cut into uh, the design underground. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to explain what that is for everybody. So yeah, uh, during this last election, I was been feeling very uh, isolated uh, by design. The, you know, the design industry wants to make you feel isolated. If you're a conservative designer, you're or religious or Anything that doesn't fit the stereotype, uh, stereotype, the algorithm, and the design industry as a whole is going to make you uh, make you suffer on that one. So mm -hmm. I started manually figuring out, okay, who's conservative, just by following folks. Like, okay, you kind of think like me, and I'm going to follow her, <laughs> electing my uh, band of misfit toys, and <laughs> saying, hey, let's let's talk, let's let's get groups together, kind of fight the algorithms on Instagram and dribble and like let's follow each other when we post stuff that turned into more conversations that turned into so big of a uh like on instagram we we can't uh bring anybody into our group anymore we have so <laughs> many people in there so we have a slack channel that's coming into like sharing work talking politics talking all kinds of different unique things and it's a very robust and live community so if you're involved if you want to be involved with something like that, that reach out to me on instagram I'll get you the links for that. We'll get you in the design underground. And it's just, it's, it's a possible conference in the future. It's a possible, uh, uh, work share type thing where we don't really know where, where this is going to go in the future, but it, my, my main mission is to get, uh, people that are not lefts, not necessarily conservative, like I said, to have, if you want to get political, you can, if you just want to talk design and, and, uh, and how to progress in your uh how to develop your business mm -hmm. uh, those are the types of conversations i'm most interested in mm -hmm. uh those types of open open forums where you can actually have really great conversations without worrying about being canceled mm -hmm. uh right and left i mean the only thing you could possibly do is say something incredibly racist or like or uh threaten somebody like even if it's on the borderline like like <laughs> if it's coming to attention like i don't care like just don't be an absolute dickhead. I do reserve the right to kick you out if I want to, but I've never had that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, my the, our side of the political spectrum tends, tends to be very respectful and open-minded. But yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, there's going to be a right-leaning slant just because that's who's uh, being approached to it or mm -hmm. being attracted to it at the moment. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I've, I've noticed the uh, last couple, like maybe year or two, that like some of like my favorite graphic designers have been more like christian leaning people there's just something yeah. like they just do like more christian based kind of design work but it's it's really clean and simple but really beautiful beautiful yeah it's great yeah. i think it's because it's uh it, it harkens back to a, an era of craft right so mm -hmm. the baroque era and things like that were very you know craft heavy and, and mm -hmm. You have to, if you're going to paint something in a church, you'd have to be a mass, master at it. Yeah. The church would be the, or, uh, or like, that's what I don't like about the church. They, they would be the ones saying, oh, yeah, you're a master. Yeah. You're not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that, to me, a lot of that stuff is just very much just a different theocracy with a different name. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it did create some fantastic art. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it did have its benefits, right? So yeah. there is a general, inherent level of quality and i think the church especially back in the day scientifically and artistically were able to hit on it mm -hmm. but you know whenever you get a big group of people involved and that's what i always fear about the design underground it becomes a bureaucracy to the point where it lacks its soul yeah uh, <laughs> so to speak uh so that's something i'm always gonna be fighting against i'm gonna always be a rebel even within my own group mm -hmm. i'm gonna be kind of like pushing that stuff so uh yeah 
it's, it's, it should be a really entertaining. I, I really want to meet folks. I want to I want to get a group together and do some sort of conference in the future. Yeah. And we focus on business development and figuring out how to make it in this industry that's so regulated, whether it's ideology, uh, ideologically and, and uh, you know, how to make it in the business world and mm -hmm. not lose your soul, right? Yeah. And how to stand up and sometimes that means getting fired. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's okay. You <laughs> I've done it. I've been fired <laughs> two major times in my life. And yeah, was I was happened. telling you, uh, what's his name? Uh, so you felt like on the last episode, like I walked, I had to walk away from like one, one of the, like the biggest events I've had to like walk away from. It's like a yep. big, uh, like I was charging them a lot. <laughs> it was like a nice uh, paycheck, and yep. they they dropped like a couple of days prior to the event that I was going to do. They're like, "Oh, we need you to uh, register your vaccine card on this uh, this portal." I'm like wait a minute it's like oh my like, they're like deep it's like so um i try going about like the the route okay well i can give you like a negative COVID test like is there anything else like i can i mean that will work and like in the end like it just didn't work out i was like no what it, it's not worth it yeah and, um, and there's like a, a few other ones too but that one was that one was like a big big job i, I walked away but the funny thing though is that like the karma like it's just like uh sometime works on your side because like the week after that like i had like five consecutive events like in the nice. row like, <laughs> back, back to back to back to back yeah it works in mysterious uh, ways man yeah, exactly <laughs> like, I'm, like i'm kind of dumb like for walking away but at the same time it's like long term it, it wasn't going to be worth it anyway yeah even for like maybe it was like a million dollars i swear i would not do you sure about that i don't know no, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't. Like, I mean, uh, I have like everything I need. Like, I'm not rich, but I have like everything. Yeah, yeah. What I, need. <laughs> I can feed my kids. I'm happy. Yeah, like, yeah. They're happy, so I'm happy. Like, uh, my dad got the vaccine and he had a heart attack not too long later. And I, I, mean, wow. I just ran into a friend of mine. She's my age, which is old still, but you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, she had the same. She has the same symptoms and got the same shot from the same area in the same little town, mm -hmm. and she had the same symptoms. Like she, she had a, uh, a cardiac arrest in her hand. Wow! And she's like a really fit baseball player. So you know, and it's more than that. Like it's what it goes. What you're saying, like it's you're never going to be waking up at night because you didn't stand up for your own morals, and if you actually sacrifice something because of the way you think or, or because of the boundaries you set for yourself mm -hmm. you're gonna see that mm, yeah you know, my dad my dad got the vaccine and he's upset about it yeah he, he's got two of them because he, he he capitulated to his work you know i think i think capitulating to his work actually did more damage than even the heart attack did. yeah mm. so i mean we all have to live with our own decisions and and you know sometimes the hard choice at the time is going to be the right choice and it's going to make life easier down the road even if it's hard at the time. yeah and people should and people are even if you're left-leaning you've got to give people some grace on that like you know if you're making a choice like my sister decided to go the black uh blm route she regrets it now but she went that route we've got to give it to her you mm -hmm. know she stood up for something at the time and we don't talk anymore so she sacrificed her relationship <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But you know you got to give it to her. She stood up for something, right? Like, yeah. If you're gonna look at, you're gonna put a silver lining on something, and then try to give people grace and think about it logically and the way people are thinking about stuff. You got to think about it that way. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, it's a two, it's a sword that has two edges, and you gotta you gotta approach it that way. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. I, I think I think that's why these conversations are really important because it I think it, it helps everybody uh, to develop your 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 principles that way. Like when those things those challenge, challenges finally come about you they don't necessarily become challenges because you have those strong morals or those those values so it's like easy to say no mm -hmm. you, you you'll you'll try and make it work but if, if, if it's going to come into conflict with your values or your, your principles yeah. it's, it's going to be easy to walk away if you have that strong foundation from the start yeah oh, that's right and then like nothing's really it, easy is a word that should be stricken from the <laughs> language. Like, I don't think not, if you're doing something right, it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, 
uh, if you're going to be good at something, it's never going to be easy. And, and that even includes standing up for yourself and being your own self best, your, your own best advocate. It's not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even something yeah, that, that you, you love doing, like it's going to be hard. Like I work yeah. my butt off. <laughs> it's yeah. like something that's easy, but at the same time, I still work my my butt off. And uh, yeah, it's it's at the same time it's re- rewarding at the very end. It's it's really it's so rewarding that it makes right. it worth it. So you think about like what you were doing before, and like, well, if I'm going to be working hard, I'd rather be working hard at something that I enjoy doing. Yeah, yeah. I think motivation. Yeah. gets mistaken with easy yeah, so when, yeah when, definitely. I, when i talk to you like, my yeah. daughter, like I, I can draw this let me draw this real quick it's like oh you do it yeah. so easy you're so, e- so good at that so easy it's like, dude, you're not doing 40 fucking years of busting my ass yeah. because you know i like it mm-hmm. i like it so i i put you know and the reason they're good at what they do is they like to a certain degree what they do and yeah. it's just dealing it, it, it's like it's like gardening right if you're going to put effort into something it's going to take fertilizer and water irrigation and the right type of soil and some attention to detail Mm -hmm. and weeding and boom you have a big plant and your neighbor just put a plant in the ground and just left it Mm -hmm. and wow you make it look so easy it's like yeah yeah (laughs) you know but you know it wasn't easy i did a lot of work yeah, like in retrospect, yeah, like damn, like I put all those hours in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess we can kind of start ending the show. Um, uh, I, I have a one question. Uh, how, because you were on, on our show really early on. Uh, I think you're like the second or third episode. Um, how much, how long after did you kind of start doing Design Underground after our doing our show? Dude. Actually, a while. It wasn't until this last election. Mm-hmm. So it's brand, it's brand staking new. Mm. So I was, uh, I mean, I was, I think I was still, was I was still working at Funko at the time? I no, don't I think remember. I just started at Decent. I just started at Decent. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, no, it was, it wasn't up till this, uh, till pretty much a, a Trump lost. Mm-hmm. That's when we st- I started this. I, I could not stand social media at the time. Mm-hmm. And just started collecting <laughs> folks, and we started. Uh, we, that's when we started it. Hmm. We were after his last election. Oh, okay. It's brand new. It's grown quite a bit since then. <laughs> so it has, it has some major momentum, and we're getting new folks all the damn time. So it's, mm-hmm. it's really cool to see grow. Have you, have you thought about uh, just making it into it like a? I don't know, like some sort of like a social media website kind of thing. Um. Or for like a DB yeah. and art kind of site, or you know what I'm talking would, about? Yeah, that'd be cool. I want to do something a little different. Like, mm-hmm. like, there's lots of social, like, dude, we're so in a day with social media. I kind of yeah. use existing technology and connect folks mm-hmm. and build a network first before we come up with a business plan. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, monetization for me right now is not even a priority. Mm-hmm. It's getting people connected that can meet like-minded folks and potentially get client work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've gotten some work out of the design on the ground. Uh, I'm about ready to ship some work off to other folks and give clients uh, that I can't handle right now to some folks that I know here. So yeah, uh, it's, it's more about the network right now. And we're using the Slack platform to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, after saying this, I'll, uh, we'll probably be banned from Slack, but we'll find something else. <laughs> we, have, we have a huge, list of, you know, developers and designers and so if you guys want to start a business inside the design underground that's great my goal is right now is to get people know, uh, talking to each other and feel not like they're alone mm-hmm. that's like that's my biggest thing and right. it's really easy to feel that way inside of like being a remotely anything close to conservative in the design industry yeah so that's where we're at right now we're in the beginning stage but it's, it's becoming something good yeah i right? mean it, it, it. Yeah, it's growing pretty nicely. Like, I, I just, you invited this show to the uh, Instagram thing, uh, I don't know how long ago, like two, three months ago. And then all of a sudden, it's like the that Slack. That was 12 years ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm seeing like the Slack channel, I'm like seeing like all these messages posted. I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of fucking people. But it's, it's, it's great to see. Fun. It's great, yeah, to, it's great see. to see. And, you know, we're far and few between, but there's we're here. Yeah. And, uh, we're not the majority, and I, nor do I think we're ever going to be. But 
not in, last, in my lifetime anyway. But you know, <laughs> let's let's bring craft. Let's push each other. Become a commodity that is uh, incredibly valuable that can't be ignored. That's my goal. Nice. Um, all right. I guess we'll kind of end it there. Uh, I guess Derek, if you want to like plug anything, uh, your website. Yeah. Design Underground. Follow me on Instagram if you want to have if you have more questions about the Design Underground or uh, just interested in following my crazy weird artwork. <laughs> give me a follow. Give me a message. I'd be happy to help out. Yep. All right. Uh, I guess that's the show. Uh, thank you, Derek Weiss, for being on. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, Benevolent Asshole, my co-host. I'm Senior Filth. Uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. See you another time. Save your audio.